Hello, I'm Eddie Kraft, and we welcome you to WNBS Live. This program comes to you each Wednesday from 7 to 7.30. Our speaker is Brother Wesley Simons, who is the director of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. He's also the minister of the Stony Creek Church of Christ in Elizabethan, Tennessee. We want you to be a part of our program by watching us each week, and now we present unto you Brother Simons. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our program, WNBS Live, which stands for Wednesday Night Bible Study Live, coming to you from the Stony Creek Church of Christ in Elizabethan, Tennessee, from our TV studio here at the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. And we appreciate so very much you being with us tonight. We're going to have a great Bible study, and we want you to be a part of it. Now, starting tonight, in every Wednesday night hereafter, Lord willing, we'll be with you at 7 o'clock. We want you to tune in and study the Word of God with us. Don't forget, you locate that Bible, pencil and paper, and don't take our word for anything. Your soul is too valuable for that. Now, tonight we've got a very interesting study. And, but before we go to that study, I want to tell you this. When I was in school, and they gave me a math problem, and then showed me an example of how to work the problem, boy, that helped. Or English grammar. Say, here's a rule in English grammar. And then the English teacher get up there and show how to apply the rule. That helped. We're going to show you the same thing from the Word of God tonight. Now Hannah's going to read to us a rule, so to speak, from Mark 16, 15 and 16. Hannah. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now notice that. Here's the Great Commission. Where the Lord said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. There's the rule. Man, I wish we had some examples of how to apply the rule. Well, we do. In the book of Acts, you have various examples of conversion. And we're going to be looking at one of those tonight, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And we want to look, first of all, at Acts 8, verse number 26. Notice what the word of God says. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. So notice, the angel speaks to the preacher and says, I want you to leave, and I want you to leave Samaria and go down to the way that leads down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now I want you to notice the angel spoke unto the preacher, not the one that was going to be converted. Not that that matters. You know why? In Acts 10 verse number 3, our next chart, notice what you'll see. The Bible says, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Now in this case, I want you to notice the angel spoke to the individual that needed to be converted. But that didn't prove that he is converted. That didn't prove he is saved. I was working with a man one time in Pikeville, Tennessee, trying to convert him, trying to show him what the word of God said. And Lo and behold, I met him one day and he said, Preacher, you don't need to come back and talk to me anymore about the Bible. I said, why is that? He said, well, I was driving down the road and really thinking seriously about my being lost. I pulled over to the side of the road and got to thinking about it real seriously and looked in front of the car and there stood an angel. I knew right then I saved. Well, why didn't it prove this individual was saved? And so, we got to realize it takes the word of God to save us. All right, here's a question that's come in. If God helped the eunuch, 
why won't he help us? Well, here's an individual that apparently knows that God helped the eunuch. But you know, God does help us. Right. And we're going to demonstrate that through this lesson. Listen, God can't help Cornelius and help the eunuch and turn around and not help you or me. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Members of the body of Christ don't understand this. Listen, folks. All of us are not into personal evangelism by ourselves. We got God helping us. I tell members of the church here, pray this week that your pathway, the, the one who knows the truth, will cross the pathway of a truth seeker. And that way you'll be able to teach someone. And that's our obligation and our wonderful responsibility. You know, Wesley, to your angel point, Let's suppose that an angel actually did appear to him. Like you said, number one, it doesn't prove he's saved. That's right. But number two, if that angel were to tell him something different than what uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was told or anyone else was told, it would be wrong. Galatians 1. Galatians 1 said, Even if an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached unto you, let him be accursed. And so the truth is, how did he know it was an angel? You know, a lady told me one time she saw Jesus. I said, well, how do you know it's Jesus? Have you ever seen him before? And she said, no. And so they fix this up in their mind if they're not careful. But the point is, and you made a good point about Cornelius, or about uh, the Ethiopian eunuch here, the truth is an angel did appear to him and talk to him. But that did not mean he was saved, as we're going to further see. And I think we need to keep that in mind because people get so caught up in what they think they see or what they do see instead of what the Word of God says. That's exactly right. Over in Johnson City, Tennessee, condensation caused an image to appear on a window. And the Catholics over there got to holler, this is the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary. Well, what in the world does the Virgin Mary look like? And how would they know that that's the Virgin Mary? And yet there's people that will buy into those kind of things rather than listening to the word of God. That's right. And so Jesus told the truth when he said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He didn't say, and you shall see an angel, and an angel shall set you free. He didn't say that at all. Wesley, matter of fact, over in Acts chapter 10, dealing with Cornelius, the angel appeared unto him, but listen to what the angel told him. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. That's right. So it was going to be the words of the Apostle Peter that Cornelius and his household would listen to. I was reading that account, Tim, today. Acts 10, Acts 11. I challenge you to read it and go down through there and see how many times the Bible speaks of Cornelius and his household being obligated to hear the word of God. And... A lot of people don't understand that. They're waiting for a miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit or God to speak to them or Jesus or an angel to appear to them. That's not how one saved. Now, a moment ago, Hannah read to us the rule, the Great Commission. Now we're looking at an example of how to apply the rule to make sure that we get it right. Now, you know, if I'd have been Philip, I know what I'd ask. Why? In Acts 8, 26 again, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. If I would have been Philip, I would have said, Why? Why do you want me to leave? I I don't understand this. What do you mean, why? Well, in Acts 8, 12 and 13, I want you to look at the tremendous success that he is having in Samaria. And the Bible says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, by the way, notice the preaching again, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondering, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now here's a man that's having tremendous success. He is converting men and women, and lo and behold, he even converts the old false teacher, 
And right in the middle of all of this, an angel appears and says, it's time to move on. Move on? Why? Well, we're going to see why. Notice this. To show the value of just one soul. You ever thought about that? Listen to the word of God in Mark 8, 36, 37. But what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? God, how much is a soul worth? I see a man looking for truth. It's God's attitude. I'm going to help him get to the truth. I'm going to help him obey that truth. Because his soul is worth more than everything upon the face of the earth. Now you think about that. Now when you read John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Read it this way. For God so loved Wesley. Put your name there. That he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ died for you. He died for me. And we've got to understand that. Now, here's something that was called in a moment ago that I want to deal with. Look at the next chart. Why? To show that God will help one find the truth. That's why. Here is a true seeker. Notice a promise that God makes to those that are looking for truth. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now you think about it, folks. God gave his son for you, and then he says, if you'll seek the truth, I'll see to it that you're afforded the opportunity right. to know the truth. Ed, it don't get any better now. No, it don't. And you know, Wes, we're just starting. We've had a couple of uh, practice runs, so to speak. Tonight we're actually starting our show to where we're going to be going on. Who knows but what God through his providence realized. Someone out there will be looking at their computer. They're going to be watching this show. They're going to learn the truth and he's going to connect us to them through WNBS Live. That's right. You know, who knows but such a time as this. And so God opens doors for us and we've got to take advantage of those opportunities. And we realized before we started this, this would give us an opportunity to reach folks by way of internet that we wouldn't be able to reach That's right. any other way. And so there are hundreds of souls out there that may be watching this program that will learn the truth and obey the gospel. That's right, Ed. You just think about electricity and internet allows us literally to go all over the world That's right. proclaiming the word of God right here from this TV studio at the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. We're doing something tonight the Apostle Paul couldn't do. You just think about that. Proclaiming the word of God and going all over the world. At one time. Now Paul has gone all over the world through the word of God. And we are appreciative of that. And from the word of God, we find out what we got to do. Well, I want you to notice they were in a desert place according to the word of God. The Bible says in Acts 8, 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Notice the word desert. And so lo and behold, we have those who say, well, if he is baptized, he had to be sprinkled because they were in a desert place because the only water the eunuch would have had would have been the water he was carrying for drinking water. I'd have left to see that container. You know why? A little bit later we're going to see that both of them went down into it and come up out of it. That's a pretty big jug of water to say the least. But now notice the way the Bible's using the word desert. In Mark 6, 32, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Notice there's enough water to float a ship in this desert place. It just means a place that's not inhabited. That's what it's talking about. Not a lot of houses, homes, anything like that. It's not talking about a desert like the Sahara Desert. It's talking about, hey, there's not a lot of people that live in that area. We're going to see they're going to come up on water 
here in just a moment. Now, anybody got a comment? You want to say anything? Or uh, ask a question about what we've studied so far? Dealing here with the uh, conversion of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, God will do his part, according to John 7 and verse 17, but man must do his part. Right. right. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 teaches, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So God does his part, but man must seek God. You know, sometimes a Calvinist might argue, well, here's a guy that's wanting to know the truth, but you're sitting home watching Bonanza or some TV show, and they're lost because of you. No, there's three people involved in this. There has to be a true seeker. There has to be one that's willing to go. And then God has a part in it. Right. Right. Suppose I decide, Tim, that someone out there uh, it wants to obey the gospel, and I'm not going to mess with him. Does God have any other help? Could God see to it maybe Wesley would then go and get to him, even if I didn't take advantage of that opportunity? God is bigger than what we give him credit for sometimes. God has said, if you are seeking truth, I'll get someone to you. So you got, like you said, God does his part. I've got to do my part. I've got to take the gospel to the lost and dying world. But it's our viewers' part tonight that they've got to do something as well. What is that? They've got to listen, believe, and obey the gospel. That's right. With that in mind, Michael, why don't you, well, we've got a question. Let me deal with the question. Michael, I'll come back to you in a moment. Let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to read Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 just a minute. Why did the angel not tell him what to do? Now, you know, we talked about that angel a few moments ago. Why didn't the angel do it? Well, you know, the Bible says that the gospel has been put into earthen vessels. Right. Now, I'm convinced that sometimes we don't get the full meaning of that. When it says the gospel was put in earthen vessels, it's talking about that's the way inspiration came. The apostles were to be led into all truth. Now, later it was written down. Now, a moment ago, Hannah read... Mark 16, 15, and 16. Let me just get verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Oh, I've had people say, if that's right, you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. You've got a man standing between a sinner and God. What are you going to do about that, Wesley? I didn't put that man there. God Almighty did. Remember Romans 10? Even when you're talking about believing, how shall they hear without a preacher let me tell you something you can't be saved without a man standing between you and God Almighty I know of eight of them right here those who wrote this book Matthew, Mark Luke and John Peter and Paul, James and Jude alright now I want, you, I want you to understand then we got to read this book, sure. James you want to make a comment? Yes. alright go ahead I do Okay, and talking about him referring to Mark 16, verse 16, well, look at Acts 8, 12, and 13, and it also applies in that. Acts 8, 12, but when they believed, okay, Mark 16, 16, and he that believeth, okay, Philip's priest, and things concerning the kingdom of God, the church, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. Now, he did not just say, notice one time, but notice verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also, so he believed as Mark 16, 16. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. And he continued with Philip. So we can see Mark 16, 16 also applies to Acts chapter 8, 12 through 13. That's right. Good. That's great, James. Good point. Now, Michael, a moment ago, I wanted you to read Hebrews 5, 8, 9. Will you do that for us now, please? Okay. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I want you to notice that we've got to obey. Obey what? What's revealed? Who revealed it? Inspired men. These inspired men stand between us and going to heaven. And that's how faith comes. You can't be saved without faith. The Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so it's very important that we understand what the Bible says and render obedience to it, or we're going to be in trouble come judgment day. Now, let's look at the character of the eunuch for just a moment. 
He is a good man, according to the Bible. In Acts 8, verse number 27, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Now I want you to notice then, according to this, he was a religious man. He was a man that was an honest man. He was over the treasury. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So here's a man that's a very good man. But let's look at the next verse. Verse 28. Was returning and sitting in his chariot and read Esaias the prophet. He was a Bible reader. Now, what would have happened if he had died at this point? You ever thought about that? What most denominational preachers would have done? Well, they'd have preached him right into heaven. Uh, let me ask you a personal question. Have you ever gone to a funeral where anybody was lost? I've never been to a funeral yet where anybody was lost. Now what I mean by that, when the preacher gets up there and preaches, they usually preach the man or woman right into heaven. Oh, this, this person read his Bible, this person did X. But you know, according to Matthew 7, 13 and 14, the majority of people are going to be lost. Now here's a man who took his Bible with him to Bible study. He had been to Jerusalem for to worship. He is returning and he was reading the Bible, the book of Isaiah. Well, if he'd have dropped dead right there, many preachers would have preached him into heaven. Oh, he was reading his Bible. He was an honest man. He was over the treasury. He had traveled over a thousand miles one way to worship God. And that is a wonderful point right there. We got some weak kneed wishy washy brethren that can't make it two miles to a church building to worship God. And if it's raining, you can hang it up for some of them. They're not coming. What an attitude. Hey, let me tell you something. We're going to stand next to this man come judgment day. And you better understand that, and I understand that. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Eddie, we better be good Bible students. That's exactly right. And Wesley, sometimes, unfortunately, good people will judge themselves by the bad members of the church. Right. They'll say, well, I look at oh so-and-so. They're members of the church of Christ. And they do this, this, and this, but I don't do those things. And so I'm better than they are. Well, folks, who in the world will start comparing themselves to a hypocrite? That's right. We don't want to pick the bad people out and say, well, we're better than they are. So what? The thing is, we got to obey the gospel. Being good is wonderful, but being good isn't good enough if we don't obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard a guy ask you on radio one time, you mean to tell me, Wesley, that all the good things I do, love my wife, go to church now, and do the things that I do I didn't do before, don't help me a bit. And you point out, yeah, they help you. They make you better because you're applying biblical principles, but it doesn't make you saved. That's right. That's right. You know, the people in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, they did many wonderful works. That's right. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out demons in thy name? Now watch it. And done many wonderful works in thy name. The Lord didn't deny that they did a lot of good works. But you know what? They didn't do the will of the Father. You and I have got to do the will of the Father. Now I can go out here and be good to widows and orphans and people who are far less fortunate than I but if I don't obey the gospel, friends, that is not going to save my soul. Right. If doing good works by themselves could save my soul, I certainly didn't need Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross for me. And I definitely need Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit gets involved now. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 8, 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now watch, the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip, not to the eunuch. Now this is important. You won't find anywhere in the Bible where the Holy Spirit, Christ, or God Almighty tells anybody what to do to be saved. 
even when Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus. He said, what would thou have me do, Lord? And you remember what he has told? Go to Damascus to the street, call straight, and thou be told thee what thou must do. And so, friends, you and I, we've got to study this Bible to find out what we've got to do. And Tim, we've got to hand it down to others so they themselves will know what to do. This demonstrates the power of God's Word. That's exactly right. And it takes the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to save a person. Sure. We've had people right. that call in on a radio program that would tell us, well, you guys don't believe that the Holy Spirit saves. Well, we sure, we sure do believe that the Holy Spirit saves, but the question is, how does he save? That's right. Over in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's through the teachings of the Holy Spirit right. that one is saved. Being born of water and of the Spirit, according to John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. That's right. Friends, if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved. And after you're saved, if you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved. But how does the Holy Spirit lead one? Through the inspired word of God. You, if you want to see some confused people, you watch these people that claim to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Man, they are confused. We've had them call the radio program. One had called in and said, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and there's only one in the Godhead. Right behind them, somebody called in, well, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and there's three in the Godhead. Then somebody called in right behind them, well, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and you've got to speak in tongues in order to know you're saved. Right behind him, somebody called in, I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you don't have to speak in tongues in order to know you're saved. Friends, you better follow those who have been truly baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's the apostles. That's right. right here, we want you to follow these inspired men. Not people today that's claiming to have it, but those that we know did have it. Right. So it's very important that you and I have the right standard, and that standard is the word of God. And Wes, you got a lot of denominational people then that listen to all that and say every one of them is right. Yeah, oh yeah. Now that's amazing. I wish I could have convinced my first grade teacher that that was the way it was because yeah. she thought her answer was right and mine was wrong. Mm -hmm. But you see, these people all believe different doctrines. They practice different things and yet they claim that every one of them is right. Now if I took the position tonight, you got to believe and be baptized to be saved. You said, no, you, all you got to do is believe. And Tim says, well, I think you both of you are all right, but I think you can be sprinkling someone. Somebody else says, no, you got to immerse them. And then someone says they're all all right. You can't have that and have the law of rationality and where you have either something is true or false, and it cannot be both true and false at the same time. That's right. Howard, uh, give First Thessalonians 5.21, and you're, you're going to see the importance here, ladies and gentlemen, of not just taking anything as being true. You've got to do what the Word of God says. Howard, what does 1 Thessalonians 5.21 say? Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Notice, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Not prove some things. Nearly every religious group can prove some things. The Bible says prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Now I want you to notice that once... Philip is commissioned, go join thyself to the chariot, that he ran, look at verse 30, Acts 8 verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, understandest thou what thou readest? Man, wouldn't it be great if we ran, and we did what God wanted us to do? Notice the Spirit did not say go teach, the Holy Spirit already told him that in the great commission. You know, the Holy Spirit had enough confidence in Philip to know if I get him around somebody reading the Word of God, he'll teach him the truth. Right. Has he got that much confidence in you? That much confidence in me? You know, it's sad that here we are, we know what the Word of God says, and yet sometimes we won't share these glorious truths with other people. Well, we're going to answer for that come Judgment Day. Now, what's the attitude of the eunuch? In Acts 8, 31, and he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? 
And he desired Philip that he would come up unto him, uh, come up and sit with him. All right, now, notice he wanted to know, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, well, how can I? Except some man should guide me. It's the job of those who know the truth to guide those who don't. Mm -hmm. That's why God Almighty said to you as parents to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Wesley, you can see here that, that uh, the eunuch, he had a great attitude. You know, here he says, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him to have a Bible study. Eddie's probably done it. I know you've done it, and I've done it. I've asked different religious people and even some denominational preachers, let's have a Bible study. And they say, no, I'm not going to study the Bible. <laughs> what, what are they afraid of? You know, I'd like to know what are they afraid of. Why can't we sit down and study the Word of God? Because God's not the author of confusion, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 33. But what, look at the attitude here of the eunuch. How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. A Bible study. You know, and, and God didn't say, uh-oh, you're putting a man between you and me now. See, he brought the man into the picture. He That's said, right. I can I accept some man? Guide me. So That's in other right. words, someone who has matured in the faith and knows the word of God, I can seek for guidance. All of us at one time or another have gone to someone and asked Bible questions too. What are we doing? How can I accept some man guide me? We're trying to find out what the truth is. And so it's not a matter of just putting a man, somebody between us and God. It's a matter of putting God first. That's right. That's right. Uh, Vicki, I want you to get Romans 10. I want you to read, if you will, in just a few moments about verses 13 through 15. But now we got a we got a question coming in. What is the value of reading scripture? Well, that's a good question, and we're thankful for that, that question. Well, the value of reading scripture is to develop faith. Well, how do you know that? Well, Vicki, if you're over there, before you read the verses I told you, read verse 17, Romans 10, 17. Let's see how faith comes, ladies and gentlemen. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now there is the value of reading and studying the word of God. Right. Now I want you to read, I believe it's about verses 13 through 15, about how can they hear without a preacher. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall... And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Well, now there's the value of, of studying the word of God. In this case, the preacher's taken the word to people. And the Lord says those who carry the word of God, they got beautiful feet. That's a great work, is what it's saying. And there's, there's not a greater work to do than to preach God's word. God only had one son, and he's a preacher. And so it's a privilege to be able to follow in his footsteps and proclaim the word of God. Anybody got a comment? Wesley, uh, that word's going to judge us at the day of judgment. John oh, yeah. 12, 48, He that rejecteth me, receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word I've spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. That says enough to me to show me the value of scripture. Oh yeah, exactly. Now, I, I tell people when I study with them, we got a jail ministry going and I say to them, ladies, if you go down here and you're gonna take a driver's test, you better know the Tennessee driver's manual, right? Oh yeah, they say, that's right. Well, if you're gonna be judged at the end by the word of God, like Eddie said, John 12, 48, you better know it. So you can know whether or not you have complied with it. Now Howard, I want you to turn to Revelation 20. And you may have to look up the verse. I want you to start about verse 12, I believe it is, where the books are going to be opened. And we're going to be judged out of the things that are written in the books. That's what I want you to read for us to demonstrate the value of Bible study. Now if the books are going to be open judgment day, and I'm going to be judged out of the things written in those books, I better know what's written in the books. How did I give you the right verse? Verse 12. Okay. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, 
And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Okay, great. Now let me say to those of you who are watching at home on your computer, send us a question. Uh, there's a way there that you can send a question in to us, and we'll be glad to put it up like we have other questions and deal with them. You might be sitting there thinking, well, now this is a stupid question. I'm not going to send it in. No question is a stupid question right. if it's a sincere question. And if it's bothering you, it's probably bothering somebody else that's watching this program. Howard? You know, Wesley, uh, conversion is a turning process. Right. It's a belief in action. Right. People want conversion, but they want to keep living the way they're living. And that, that's not possible by a biblical conversion. That's right. To be converted means that you leave the condition you were in, living ungodly, to accept the life of living for God Almighty. And it's important that we understand that. James? Yes, I want you to notice some in Acts chapter 17, verse... Let me see here. Verse 10, we're talking about, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, coming into the synagogue of the Jews. Note verse 11. These were more nobles. Now how did the Berea become noble? Well, then those in Thanasinaska, and that they received the word with all readiness. They were ready to hear the word of God of mine. And what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So they were scriptures, they were searched in the scriptures daily so that they can know the truth of God's word. That's interesting, James. They were checking the apostles out. That's right. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That's right. If you're going to check the apostles out, you better check us out. That's right. And we're not offended by you doing that. Hey, your soul is too valuable to listen to somebody on this program and just buy into it without going to your lie detector. Right. right here is your lie detector, the word of God. If I say all you got to do to be saved is turn the flip right here in front of me, you know what I want you to learn to say? Show it to me in the Bible and I'll believe it. Now having said that, you're going to see the Ethiopian eunuch was not told to pray the sinner's prayer. He wasn't told to come to the mourner's bench. He wasn't told to believe faith only. But yet this is what the denominational people are telling people by the millions and billions and people are buying into it and they're going to be lost judgment day right. as a result thereof. So not everybody's going to make it. Vince, if you want to, I quoted this a little bit a moment ago, but turn to Matthew 7, 21 through 23 and we're going to show you that judgment day, there are going to be some honest, sincere people there that just knew they were saved only to find out they were lost. I can't think of anything worse than to go through this life, an entire life's journey, only to find out once you die, you're lost. Wow. But yet you thought you were saved. How sad. Vince, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom. Of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prospered in thy name, and in uh, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What do you think about that? Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, cast out demons in thy name? done many wonderful works in thy name, only to hear the Lord say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you or recognized you. Mm -hmm. That's what it amounts to. Tim? Honest and sincere, weren't they, Wesley? Oh, yeah. And yet, yeah. still lost. And that's a sobering thing. Eddie Fish and I were visiting last night, and we talked about that on the way back and forth, to think that I could be lost while thinking that I'm saved the whole time. And that's a, when we deceive ourselves, that's a serious matter. Yeah, that's right. Now, we only got five minutes left, so I want to go ahead and read the verses, and I hope uh, they'll put the charts up as I read so that you can follow along, and then we'll make some comments about it. Notice Acts 8, 32, 33, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer so opened he not his mouth, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. 
And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. Now we want to come back to this. The eunuch did not want to misapply the word of God. We won't talk about that in just a minute. Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they uh, went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. Now, it's important then to see the truth relative to how this man was converted. Now, here you got Philip preaching Jesus from Isaiah, the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, is this divided in your Bible mind? They come into a certain water and says, See, there's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that confession, he baptized him into Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that amazing? Eddie, did they vote on him? Did I miss something here? Now, the Bible says nothing about voting the Lord adds to the church, Acts 2.47. And so we don't join it, and neither does anyone have to vote on us. Okay. Well, Timothy, you don't join the church. Which church was he a member of? Well, upon obedience to the gospel, he was, as Eddie uh, said, the Lord added him to his church. The Lord has only one church, according to Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And when you read Romans 16, verse 16, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So it's the Lord's church. It's Christ's church. And there's only one. That's right. That's right. So notice they didn't vote on him. Notice that he was added to the Lord's church. Eddie, back then, did they have a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, all those? No, there's only one church and all of them were Christians. That's right. And, and that's what we're trying to persuade you to be. Just a Christian. Right. Nothing more. Nothing less and nothing else. That's what this man became. Here he is going home soaking wet on that chariot. And he comes across a friend and says, Man, what happened to you? There's not a cloud in the sky. What are you doing so wet? Just became a Christian. Well, what'd you do? I ran into this preacher and he told me to pray the sinner's prayer and I became a child of God. No, he couldn't say that, could he? Nope. I ran into this preacher and this preacher said, If you'll demonstrate faith only, you'll make it to heaven. No. He said, you know, I was going down the road in my chariot reading the word of God. And a good gentleman ran up to me and said, understand thou what thou readest. And I said, well, how can I? Except some man should guide me. I invited him upon the chariot. And as we went on our way, you know, he preached unto me, Jesus. I understood it. I said, see, there's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He said, if thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. And I told him, I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. And you know, upon that confession, he baptized me into Jesus Christ. And he told me, as long as I'm faithful, I'm on my way to glory. That's right. Now, friends, is that the way you were saved? If that's not the way you're saved, then you're saved the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Now, notice what the eunuch did to become a child of God. He says, I believe. He didn't believe just anything. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He made that great confession. He repented. Now, you can read from now on, and you're not going to find where the Bible says he repented. But you know what he did? He had been up to worship under the law of Moses. He gave that up to accept New Testament Christianity. And then I want you to notice that he was baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. You might say, well, it doesn't say that there. No, but it says it in Acts 2.38. It says it in Galatians 3.27 through 29. It says, it says it in Romans 6, uh, 1 through 6. See, the sum of God's word is truth. We started out with Hannah reading. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. How in the world can somebody confuse that? The religious world turns it around to he that believeth is saved and can be baptized later if he so desires. But friends, we can't do that. Hey, thank you for being with us. Tune in next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, so we can study the greatest of all books. And may God richly bless you as you do that.